Hello, everybody. I am Paul Mori, and this is a SIG multi-cluster intro for KubeCon EU 2021. I've got with me Jeremy Olmsted thompson Hello, I'm Jeremy. I'm a software engineer, and I work on GKE at Google. Today, we're going to talk about what SIG multi-cluster is focused on and what we're all about. Uh, we'll go through the current activity and all the projects that we're working on, and then we'll get to the most important part, how you can contribute, and please do. So what is this SIG about? Uh, so multi-cluster is a extremely broad topic that means different things to different people, um, depending on who you ask. But our best definition so far is just making multiple clusters work together somehow. We touch many different functional areas, uh, but we're still trying to figure out what are the best, most durable primitives. We just want to start with you know, the basic pieces that all multi-cluster deployments need to function. We really need your input. We're looking for real user stories and use cases. Uh, we're looking for feedback on the things that we've developed and, and how they work for you or maybe don't. Um, many or all of our projects are in early stage still and are still malleable. So you know, your feedback can really impact the direction we take things. Um, if we standardize around best practices or try to push best practices, you can really help shape those. Um, and we're also finding that as we develop these new tools, uh, we are exposing new needs. So every time we you know, make something easier to do, uh, it leads to a whole bunch of new questions that we need answers to. So our approach in this SIG, uh, which really comes from uh, years of lessons that we've learned with previous attempts uh, to solve problems in this space is uh, are centered around a few kind of like keystone values. First of those is that we want to avoid premature standardization. Uh, you know, it doesn't, it, it, it actively works against progress if we make new standards before they're battle tested and before they are uh, widely adopted. We also wanna avoid solving optional problems at this point, because as Jeremy said, the area of multi-cluster is so broad and has so many different facets that um, if we allow ourselves to be distracted by shiny optional problems, we won't be able to solve the core fundamental ones that we need to as best we can. We also want to focus on specific functionality that we want to build and work backwards from specific problems into something bigger, maybe if it makes sense. So let's talk about the cluster registry. Um, as one of the, the areas that we have progress to report on. And uh, the cluster registry basically has historical roots being the single point of agreement in the community after Federation V1, uh, in that it makes sense to track multiple clusters when dealing with multiple clusters, but it was developed without a clear vision for what problems were being solved. Uh, and you know one of the things that, uh, uh, again, this, this wisdom that we've gained looking backwards is that um, cluster registry was attractive because it seems intuitively like it should be easy. Spoiler alert, it wasn't easy. Uh, it was so not easy that it was actually very hard to, to get something uh, meaningful accomplished that was durable at the time with what we knew then. Uh, and eventually, begin to sort of wither on the vine. And uh, just a couple weeks prior to the recording of this talk, cluster registry has been officially retired because we believe it's basically superseded as a concept by some things we're gonna talk about later. Another active area that we have, uh, well, Actually, the last one wasn't active. So an active area that we have, the first of many active areas that we're going to talk about today, uh, is, is called KubeFed. You may have heard about this uh, before. You may have also heard the term Kubernetes Federation. So TLDR uh, is that KubeFed is the second attempt at having, a, um, <clears throat> having something that spreads resources basically from one copy to multiple clusters. Uh, <clears throat> the um, 
the KubeFed model is basically around having new API surfaces that are distinct from the ordinary Kubernetes API and your ordinary custom resources or aggregated APIs that you may have that um, basically a fundamental primitive of KubeFed is to generate a new API surface for the so-called federated API that encompasses a template definition. Uh, it encompasses overrides. Uh, by that, we mean a uh, way to differentiate certain parts of a resource when it lands on a particular cluster, and then also placement information. Uh, this model works well for some users. In fact, KubeFed is on its way to beta, may even be beta by the time that you see this. And uh, KubeFed is currently considering how to add pull reconciliation. Uh, the, the initial model that was implemented in KubeFed was a push model. They're looking at uh, how to add pull. This touches the cluster registry and cluster tracking type of concept um, in the sense that um, <clears throat> how does a pull reconciler running in a remote cluster gain access to observe the cluster where KubeFed API surface exists? So the next few uh, uh, areas that I'm going to talk about are, are kind of all related. And it starts with this new concept that we've developed called the cluster set. So since uh, uh, conception, um, you know, sometime last year, the, the cluster set doesn't really um, correspond to an API, it is, but it is a concept that we're kind of building around here. Uh, as we mentioned before, multi-cluster means uh, different things to different people. And what we wanted to do is kind of create a well understood bounded definition of you know the multi cluster space that we're at least to start trying to address and so this is this is where the cluster set comes in and it's it's a pattern of use that we see in the field uh, that gives us you know something concrete to work with here and and that is that it's a group of clusters governed by a single authority that could be you know you as a user it could be a company um, or a team but somebody who has you know, formal authority to make strong statements about all of the clusters uh, within, that, within that set, um, a high degree of trust within the set. So we're, we're looking for you know, clusters that work together in much the same way you know, that, that uh, workloads within a cluster do and, and with you know, where communication is generally allowed, you know, maybe not between every service and every namespace, but certainly within a subset. If, uh, if two clusters should never talk to each other, they probably don't belong in the cluster set. And where expected access patterns are kind of similar. Um, the same service is governed by the same user or team um, in generally the same way. Um, but you know, some, some uh, domain where you, know, you can make, again, strong statements about how those clusters work together and, and some degree of consistency across them and that's where namespace statements comes in. And that's kind of, that's the biggest piece here. Um, basically the concept that a namespace and, and names have a consistent meaning in all of the clusters within a cluster set. So, you know, a given user's permission to access a namespace um, is consistent in clusters. So if, you know, if I have namespace foo and I can access it in clusters A and B, and namespace foo is present in C, I can also access it in C. So I don't have to think about what cluster I'm dealing with. I can just think about namespaces. Now, namespace doesn't necessarily have to exist in every cluster, but it should behave the same in clusters in which it does. And why this is important, uh, we'll get to uh, a little bit later. So the first kind of piece I want to talk about here is, is some new work we've been working on called cluster ID. This is a new KEP. Um, it is uh, on its way to, to alpha right now and will probably be uh, hopefully implemented by the time you're watching this um, or soon after. Uh, basically what we've done is we're introducing a new uh, cluster scoped cluster property CRD that is essentially a name value pair. Um, what we wanna do is kind of uh, create self-awareness for the first time in Kubernetes. Clusters are very introspective by nature we want a way for clusters to self-identify who they are in the, you know, in the broader context. And so the first way that we do this is by introducing a well-known uh, uh, resource, a cluster property instance named id.cates.io that will correspond to some uh, unique identifier for that cluster that is 
unique, uh, you know, within some well understood uh, time frame. Basically, uh, as long as that cluster belongs to a cluster set. The other piece here is a way for clusters to identify the cluster set to which it belongs. So a cluster uh, will have a cluster set.cates.io uh, cluster property. And this property will, you know, it could be the name of the cluster set, or it could be some kind of mapping to that uh, cluster's membership, but some way for that cluster to tell uh, which group it belongs to. And the point here is to give us a way to uniquely identify clusters within that cluster set for that lifetime of membership. So, you know, you could absolutely use um, the ID beyond the membership and, you know, for the lifetime of the cluster, but we really want to make sure that there's a way to uniquely identify clusters as long as they're in a cluster set. So we can start building on that. And this is really, you know, getting into the most important parts here. We now have a reference point for a multi-cluster tooling to build on. So, it, you know, you could use this to disambiguate backends for headless services between clusters, which we'll get to in a minute, um, a coordinate for scheduling work, or even a way to annotate metrics and logs. So if you're feeding a bunch of data from, from your cluster set, you can you know, have some tag to look back where that, where that data is coming from, you know, help with uh, root cause analysis and whatnot. Um, and, and we think this is a really important building block. I just wanna shout out to Laura for driving this work. It's been awesome uh, to see the progress here over the last few months, and, and this is really exciting. So let's talk about how we're using this stuff. Um, Multi-cluster services. Uh, this has been an ongoing project for a bit over a year now in the SIG and has been making great progress. Uh, services are a multi-cluster building block, of course. If you have multiple clusters, you have services, you wanna consume them across clusters. That's how we build applications on Kubernetes. Um, multi-cluster services builds on the concept of na namespace sameness and allows a single service to span or be consumed by multiple clusters um, as though it is uh, local to that cluster. So if I have a service, for example, named foo in namespace bar, and I've deployed this across multiple clusters, using the MCS API, um, I can tie these together into one global bar foo service that can be consumed from anywhere, you know, as though it was a local service in that cluster. The, con the consumer really doesn't have to care. We've really tried to focus only on the API and, and the common behavior that's necessary in, in all platforms. And really, really the, the experience of consuming multi-cluster services and, and leave as much room as possible for various implementations. And so we've already started to see some of these spring up. Uh, for example, uh, Submariner has a great uh, open source implementation. Um, there's a managed offering with uh, Google Kubernetes engine. And we've started seeing service meshes like Istio uh, begin to adopt the API as well, and, and they're currently working on an implementation. We've left a lot of uh, decisions, or as many as we can, uh, up to the implementation. So, you know, a big one here is that the uh, the way we've designed this a control plane can be centralized or decentralized, um, but consumers ever only ever rely on uh, local data. So, you know, in some uh, in some implementations, it might make sense to have you know one controller connect to all the clusters and manage things in another implementation. Um, it might make sense for you know, each cluster to reach out to the other clusters and, and uh, pull in the information that it needs. Um, but uh, the experience of the consumer is, is always the same. You know, there's a consistent resource that we call the service import uh, available within each cluster. And that will help you discover uh, the endpoint information you need to connect to services and other clusters. So to the consumer, they get the same behavior uh, no matter what the implementation does. And the end goal here is that you can take your existing cluster IP and headless services um, that you have today in a single cluster, uh, turn on the, the multi-cluster services API with an implementation, and you get a multi-cluster equivalent service that spans all of your clusters, but can be consumed um, in the exact same way as a, as a cluster local service. So uh, you know, they work exactly as expected from a consumer perspective. Another area that we have work uh, ongoing in is called the work API. Uh, so in contrast to the pattern that we previously described in federation, where there is like a uh, one to one, uh, well, one to many mapping of resource and control plane to resources that are put onto different clusters, 
uh, and we're kind of shipping individual resources as the units. Uh, instead, the work API takes a different approach that a, uh, the unit being shipped around is a collection of resources instead of individual resources. This is currently in a pre-alpha state with a KEP-like document coming together um, and a little bit of code going into the Kubernetes SIGs work API repo. And uh, this is another area where we're working backwards in the sense that we have an initial concentration on finding the right API surface for a single cluster to have work applied within it um, before we do higher level things. Next steps also approach the registration concept in the sense of how does the cluster where work is defined know about clusters where it is applied? How do clusters that are supposed to have work applied on them know about the cluster where the work is defined? And no pun intended, but very much appreciated. It's in here. Still a work in progress. We need some input. Uh, so this is one area that you can contribute to. As you can see, one challenge that's absolutely present in this space, it touches a lot of uh, different, um, <clears throat> touches a lot of different areas and sort of comes back to that first slide uh, is that tracking clusters is definitely a, a palpable concept. It's easy to talk about conceptually. It's hard to materialize into functional software and also is a strange attractor to be tempting as something to build first simply because it seems easy. Uh, and we're avoiding characterizing a registry as a first step. You may, have, you may have sensed as a theme running through this presentation that we're like very careful to avoid doing that. We're also avoiding a gravity towards standardization on a registry because we think it's important that there be room for many different schemes uh, that are best fit to a particular situation. So now that we have multi-cluster primitive, multi-cluster primitives, what's next? That's the big question I'm left with. And that's where we get to where you come in. We need your input. Um, we'd love for you to share your use cases, problems, ideas with us. Uh, and you can see here, we've got some coordinates for the homepage, the Slack channel, and the mailing list. Um, our meetings are Tuesdays at 12.30 Eastern, 9.30 Pacific, and 16.30 UTC time. Thanks a lot for coming, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Uh, we appreciate your attention and giving us the time. Uh, come help us define uh, multi-cluster Kubernetes. Yes, we'd love to have you. Look forward to seeing you in the next meeting of Kubernetes SIG multi-cluster. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks, everyone.